understand life as we know it and also understand um, life outside Earth. So without wasting any more time. Um, so we are more or less familiar that we have five oceans um, on Earth. Um, we have, just to name a few, we have the Pacific, um, we have the Atlantic, we have the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Ocean right on the top, and the last one is the Southern Ocean which surrounds Antarctica. Um, and while most of us assume that the ocean bottom is mainly flat, um, that's not exactly tr true. Um, you can see from this map, which is a topographic map, that shows um, the elevations um, across the world oceans. And as you can see, we have some of the longest mountain ranges, ranges on Earth actually within the ocean. Um, apart from, from that, about 80% of life as we know today actually lives within the ocean. Um, also, apart from life as we know it, making use of photosynthesis, life in the deep sea not really does not really use photosynthesis. So that's something that I will be talking about in the next coming slides. So what does life in the deep sea actually use to survive in the deep? And finally, as we know today, about 50 to 60 percent of all the car carbon emitted on Earth is actually is absorbed into the ocean. So the ocean is kind of a vital a vital feature in a fight against climate change. So among the numerous things that we know of the oceans, there are a vast amount of things that we do not know. Um, and although there are so many things that we do not know, our oceans are continuously under threat almost every single day due to a variety of reasons, some of them being um, ocean pollution due to plastic, but also um, overfishing just to name a few. So before we get into anything about the oceanic crust, I just want to briefly talk about how we think the oceans form. So the oceans are thought to have formed about 4 billion years ago, and the Earth itself is 4.5 billion years ago. So the oceans or the water within the oceans are mainly a result of volcanic eruptions, so eruptions rich in water vapor um, actually led to the formation of the oceans as we know it today. But apart from just water vapor from volcanic eruptions, we also have um, frozen water coming in, being impacted on Earth through asteroid impacts that also resulted in, in water. Um, so it's a cycle of volcanic eruptions, asteroid impacts that led to liquid water on Earth, but later due to evaporation and condensation that we're familiar more or less with as the water cycle um, results in erosion of the subsurface rocks. So when you erode rocks on the subsurface, um, you tend to strip rocks of important elements like calcium, sodium, chloride. So when you erode these elements of the rock, they end up being soluble in water and eventually land into the ocean. So for billions of years, this process of erosion and evaporation has made the oceans actually sal saline as we know it today. So high sodium chloride um, is what makes the ocean salty. And eventually, as a result of um, continental drift or plate tectonics, another name that we know it by, um, resulted in the five oceans that we see today, but also in in the various continents that we know how Earth appears today. Um, so I just talk about plate tectonics because that's one of the main um, drivers for the oceanic crust or the main feature that forms the oceanic crust. Um, we know that there are seven major plates that exist on Earth. Um, and we have various features actually, or various geological processes that take place on these plate tectonics. Uh, 
among them there are three important processes that actually shape earth as we as it appears today uh, the first one being subduction where you have geological destruction as i would like to call it it's where you have a older crust an older oceanic crust for example being subducted under a younger crust so you have destruction of rock um, and the other one would be lateral sliding where you have two plates gliding against each other um, and just kind of being being slided in different directions due to various strains and stresses and the third kind of process that shapes the oceanic crust is spreading so this is geological um, production of new crust where you have volcanic eruptions that take place and you actually produce new fresh oceanic crust through spreading so when you look at you, you look at this map and i think it quite nicely shows you the three main processes that actually shape the oceanic crust um, the first one that I spoke about is subduction. So if you look at this part here, um, you can see the oceanic crust of the oceanic lithosphere actually being subducted under another plate. And this is where, or this is one of the most seismically active zones on Earth, where we have a large amount of volcanoes, but also a large amount of earthquakes that take place. And this feature or this um, subduction zone is what we call a convergent plate boundary where you have two plates basically converging into each other or you know just impacting or just colliding into each other another um, key process for oceanic crust is the divergent plate boundary this is where um, you actually make um, new oceanic crust or you you produce new rock as I would like to call it. Um, and if you would have to actually try to imagine why you have this process, it's mainly because you can imagine it by holding a piece of paper in your hand where you pull either sides of the paper and you actually, what happens eventually is you're gonna create enough strain if you, by pulling on either side that you rip the paper out from the center. And this is exactly what happens with the oceanic crust. You have subduction taking place on either side and you create enough strain where the plate can no longer um, be a single plate but just breaks and when you have such a rupture that takes place what happens is below the oceanic crust is nothing but the asthenosphere or there's more fresh magma there so that tends to erupt onto the surface creating a fresh or a younger crust and it's it's basically the process of convergent plate boundaries and divergent plate boundaries that results in plate tectonics or, or also resulted in continental drift as we, as we know of it. So I'm going to talk about the two main uh, boundaries that is the conversion as well as the diversion plane boundaries. So first um, I will briefly talk about the convergence. So the convergence, one of the main features of conversion plate boundaries are subduction zones and one of the most famous subduction zones as we know it is the pacific ring of fire um, this is also the most active seismic, seismically active zones on earth with a huge amount of volcanoes all along the pacific um, this also happens to be the zones where we have had five most strongest earthquakes ever recorded on earth have taken place also when we have underwater earthquakes um, we do have something that we call as tsunamis uh, that are correlated with these underwater earthquakes and these are massive waves that are highly destructive um, for humans as well as the natural environment so these some these are some of the major destructive processes associated with subduction zones uh, but apart from being destructive um, these zones also host some of the most unique environments on earth one of them that 
quite a few of y'all might be very might be very known um, is trenches and I just want to get one want to just um, have a video where we take a deep dive into one of the most deepest trenches on earth and I want to show you how geology is not only destructive but geology actually helps sustain life in even the most deepest um, darkest places on earth The infamous Mariana Trench sits like a crescent-shaped dent in the floor of the Pacific. A 2,550 kilometer long, 69 kilometer wide fracture that plummets down into a pure black void. At the bottom, it hosts the deepest known location on Earth, the Challenger Deep, 11,033 meters or 36,200 feet beneath the waves. The trench itself is but one part of a global network of deep scars that cut across the ocean floor. Features that formed from a process called subduction. In the case of the Mariana Trench, the western edge of the Pacific Plate was thrust beneath the smaller Mariana Plate to the west creating the deep fracture. Molten material then rose through volcanoes near the trench, building the nearby Mariana Islands. At its deepest point, the Mariana Trench dips down into a little explored zone of the ocean, the Hadal Zone, named after the realm Hades the underworld of Greek mythology. A suitable title for a place where the conditions of pure darkness, acidic freezing water, scarce food, and immense pressure create a challenging environment for creatures to survive in. For much of history, it was believed to be a dead zone, void of any life at all. An impossible frontier and an empty void of perils that could never be reached by any human. But in the 19th century, this was all about to change. The Mariana's depths were first plumbed in 1875, when the crew aboard the HMS Challenger cast a weighted sounding line over the side of the vessel and found they needed more rope. They had not expected there to be a location so deep, but news of its discovery caught the eye of the ambitious. Knowing it existed simply wasn't enough, and a few dared to venture to the bottom. In 1960, 85 years after the Challenger Deep was discovered on that pioneering voyage, two men set out to reach the bottom. Jacques Picard and Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh, sheltered only by a cramped bathyscape submersible called the Trieste. Their five-hour descent was fraught with challenges. The water pressure near the bottom was nearly a thousand times greater than atmospheric pressure at sea level. During the journey, this caused the viewing window to crack, limiting their time spent on the sea floor to only 20 minutes. Even in such a short amount of time, what they saw would shock the scientific community. Life, pale shrimp, and flounder-like fish, along with what they described as a dark brown diatomaceous ooze that covered the sea floor. Picard described this moment with excitement in a book about the voyage. Here, in an instant, 
was the answer that biologists had asked for the decades. Could life exist in the greatest depths of the ocean? It could. When James Cameron followed in the Triester's footsteps on board the Deep Sea Challenger in 2012, he, too, saw the sprawling microbial mats. Bizarre-looking filamentous clumps of microorganisms living off chemicals from altered rocks. 10,912 meters, or 35,803 feet down in a sunless world. It is these bacteria that support more complex creatures, for without sunlight, larger animals must instead rely on the energy produced by bacteria undergoing chemosynthesis, the deep sea equivalent to photosynthesis. you're seeing now was taken by an unmanned Japanese submersible called Kaiko in 1996. Having reached a depth of 10,897 meters, it marked the deepest dive for an unmanned submersible at the time. Its goal was to sample bacteria from the mats that Picard and Walsh had observed nearly 40 years earlier. They found that a number of these bacterial species appeared to be obligately barophilic, meaning they thrived under high environmental pressures, proving that the idea that life could only exist in more moderate conditions was flawed. But in 1998, Keiko returned to the Challenger Deep and stumbled upon more complex life. Hirondelia gigas a gigantic amphipod species. This discovery posed a bit of a mystery. The extreme pressures of the deep sea cause calcium carbonate that makes up the shells of amphipods and many marine animals to dissolve more readily in water, leaving their soft bodies vulnerable. As such, amphipods are not usually found below about 5,000 meters or 16,400 feet. And yet here in Kaiko's lights was a giant amphipod, retaining even its tough exoskeleton. It has since been found that they protect their shells using a form of aluminium armor, using chemicals in their gut to extract aluminium ions from the seafloor mud while they forage for food. In their role as detrivores, these amphipods occupy a key role in the ecosystem. They act as a cleanup crew, possessing enzymes that are able to digest even wood. In more recent times, remote submersibles have caught yet more oddities of the Mariana Trench in their headlights. Among the most abundant inhabitants are the Holothurians, sea cucumbers, like the remarkable sea pig with its ring of feeding tentacles that it uses to sift through the mud and grab onto food. Some scientists believe that Picard's fish was, in fact, a sea cucumber, for it is thought that fish are unable to survive where the pressure is so great that it would dissolve the bones of any vertebrates. The deepest known fish thrives at depths of 8,000 meters or 26,200 feet. Still two kilometers above the Challenger Deep, the Mariana snailfish, discovered in 2014, yet given the scientific name Pseudoliparis swire to commemorate Sub-Lieutenant Herbert Swire from the HMS Challenger. But snailfish and amphipods are not the only oddballs found in the trench. Gigantic xenophionophores grow to be 20 centimeters in diameter, yet consist of only a single cell. 
predatory tunicates called sea squirts anchor their bodies to the sides of canyons in wait of passing prey, while deep sea hatchet fish use bioluminescence to blend in with their surroundings. While only glimpses of these otherworldly organisms have been recorded, their abundance goes to show that life will always find a way to survive, even when faced with the intense challenge of living at the heart of the ocean's underworld. Yeah, so as you might have already seen that um, while well, we do have life even in the most deepest parts of the ocean, and what's interesting is that even with the lack of food supply that we imagine the deep sea to have, um, life at the depths use, uses actually geology um, to actually survive. So they make use of chemicals coming as a result of alteration of rocks that actually feeds this very ecosystem. Yep. So the the other very interesting feature about um, convergent margins or subduction zones are the formation of volcanoes. Um, and these start up as submarine volcanoes where you have huge amount of magma um, and huge amount of rocks being spewed into the, onto the surface. But apart from rocks, um, these magmas are full of water, water vapor as well as gases. So these are kind of explo explosive eruptions um, that take place. And eventually these eruptions or these small scale eruptions result in the formation of volcanoes or island arc volcanoes, as we would like to call them. Um, and these island arc volcanoes are quite famous along the Pacific plate margins where we see a large amount of them. They run all the way from New Zealand down to the south, all the way up um, to Japan. This is a, quite a short video just showing you or letting you experience how an underwater eruption actually looks like. Um, this was the first footage ever recorded of an underwater eruption and I'm just going to try to play it. Of the ocean at the University of Washington. I was the chief scientist on this expedition, so I led the, uh, the crews and the trip to the West Mata eruption. The video that you'll be looking at is ma large magma bubbles are about three feet across, and the bubbles are molten rock that are expanded under the pressure, of, the gas pressure of magmatic gas. And the magmatic gas, we presume, is mostly water, and when the water is under the magma, then magmatic temperatures, thousands of degrees, and when it's suddenly cooled by coming in contact with seawater, the bubble bursts. So what excites me the most about this volcanic eruption is that we have, that on the planet Earth, this is a process happening all the time, and yet we have never seen it happening in quite this way. And the ocean floors are formed almost exclusively by volcanic activity. And strangely enough, we really have never seen molten lava flowing on the seafloor from a submarine volcano. We have seen in other eruptions much shallower in the ocean, but in this case, we're actually seeing molten lava flowing on the seafloor. We're seeing these magma bubbles. We're seeing these explosive events. We're seeing the, 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 the seafloor open up and pour out magma. We're seeing these pillow lavas, probably one of the most common forms of rock on Earth. And despite the fact that this happens, 80% of the volcanoes that are 80% of the eruptions basically on Earth are happening underwater. And we've never made these observations before. Right. So that was about um, converged margins. And the next, um, or the other main feature that actually shapes the oceanic flow is spreading centers or divergent margins. And these are quite the opposite of convergent margins where you have destruction. Yeah, you actually have production or you make new oceanic lithosphere um, at spreading centers. 
Um, and as you can see here, when when you when you diverge your plate, your plate moves apart. You create a magma chamber, which feeds um, the seafloor and produces fresh rock. A classic example of this is Iceland. So Iceland is on the diverging plate boundary, and it forms part of what we term the Mid Oceanic Ridge, which is basically a divergent spreading center. Um, the Mid-Oceanic Ridge is also the longest um, mountain range on Earth um, and it's 10 times longer than um, the Andes, which is the longest mountain range on land. Um, and as you can see, um, the Mid-Oceanic Ridge, which is this black, um, red, it just, it's just black line that, run, that runs throughout our globe. Um, and w another key feature about the Mid Oceanic Ridge is, as I mentioned, it is producing fresh rock. Um, it also turns out to be the youngest part of, of the oceanic crust, while as you move away from the Mid Oceanic Crest, you encounter more older variations of the crust. A key feature that takes place along the Mid-Oceanic Ridge is something that we term as hydrothermal circulation. Um, hydrothermal, hydro in the sense means water and thermal is heat. So the circulation just basically involves heated seawater. What I mean by that is um, the oceanic crust is permeable, which means that um, seawater can actually percolate through cracks pore spaces of the oceanic crust. This is, this is fairly similar to, or fairly comparable to the formation of groundwater, where you have rainwater percolating down through rocks, um, forming groundwater reserves. So you can imagine this um, process is similar, where you have seawater instead percolating down through the rocks. And what happens is, unlike groundwater, um, the oceanic crust is pretty thin. So it doesn't counter heat source at some point of time after penetrating to um, the fairly thin oceanic crust. And when, when it encounters a heat source, you have heating of the seawater that takes place. And when you heat seawater, you have a numerous interactions that take place and numerous chemical reactions that take place. And among the numerous that take place, um, some of the key features is the production or um, enrichment of these fluids in gases as well as metals. Um, and they can go all the way up to 400 degrees Celsius. Um, and when this superheated fluid um, is heated up to that temperature, it, it gets buoyant um, and rises up to the sea flow, giving rise to what we famously call as hydrothermal vents. So these are superheated seawater vents uh, made of mainly um, metals and you have hot um, hydrothermal fluids actually coming out, which are highly enriched in various gases and compounds. And so these are the spectacular looking chimneys that we see, um, especially on, con on divergent margins. Um, and these can grow up to hundred, up to tens of meters tall, and are completely made up of metal sulfides. Um, the fluid coming out of these vents are usually in the temperature ranges of three hundred to four hundred degrees Celsius. So even at the deepest point of the ocean, um, although we assume it to be extremely cold and dark, um, the deepest points at in, in the global oceans could actually be really hot, where you could have these superheated fluids coming out through the oceanic crust. Um, and the reason they have this black smoke is because what happens when you have a superheated 300 degree, 350 degree fluid interacting with cold seawater, you, it results in instant precipitation of metals. So the black smoke that you see here is mainly iron and zinc. Um, precipitating out immediately because of a temperature difference. Um, and apart from being enriched in metals and being extremely hot, um, we now know that life actually survives in these extreme conditions. Um, 
these bands were first discovered 40 years ago, so they, they are a fairly new discovery and we still are constantly learning a lot about them every single day. But what we know for now, what we know now is life over here does not so does not need photosynthesis because this these vents are like three kilometers below the sea level, so they're extremely deep and without any sea any sunlight penetrating here, life actually lives here through as you might have heard from the previous video through the process of chemosynthesis, where life survives using various other chemical compounds coming out of these vents as a source of food. Um, the finding of this 40 years ago actually changed completely the way we think about life. Um, it it changed um, it changed the way the way we think life came into existence as well. I will talk a bit about that as well. But what's very interesting about these vents is while we saw trenches have extremely barophilic life, where life survives at extreme pressures. At hydrothermal vents, life not only survives at extreme pressures, it survives at extreme temperatures. Um, we know the temperature limit of life is about 122 degrees Celsius, which was actually discovered um, by, by cultivating some of the microbes that were found at a hydrothermal vent. And that is currently the known temperature limit that we know some of the life can actually live to. These are a few images of how diverse um, life can be at hydrothermal vents. You could have microbial life, like these white mats on the right, bottom right, but you could have whole multicellular ecosystems surviving through these fluids, like crabs, um, you could have shrimps and some, some gastropods as well, as well as these huge tube worms. So life, is highly diverse in these systems and highly productive, uh, making use of this chemical energy that these fluids provide. This is a short clip of hydrothermal vents. Yes, so as you've probably seen, um, it's a highly diverse and extremely alien world, um, even at the first looks of it. Um, and every time 
there is an expedition to some of these fans. It's always new science. So it's so much we do not know and so much we are getting to know. Um, and just because of the discovery of chemosynthesis that life does not need sunlight, it changed the very thought of how did life originate and could life have originated from hydrothermal vents. Um, and the initial um, argument for the origin of life was life um, evolving on a land-based water system, something like hot springs on land. Um, but what is flawed or what is done to be flawed in this argument was that um, billions of years ago, even if life did try to, did try to survive or did try to evolve on land, um, the sun rays or the UV radiation at that point of time, like three billion years ago, would be too harsh. Um, destroying every form of cell that would have even that would have formed but also um, three billion years ago um, there would be a large amount of asteroid impacts still taking place on earth that would that would not be beneficial for evolution of life but at the same time if life did um, initiate in the most deepest parts um, that is at hydrothermal vents where you have all all the ingredients to make life um, life here uh, could have been shielded from large of these, a large amount of these destructive processes that take place on land um, and could have evolved. So there's a whole bunch of research that's been going on and understanding and trying to prove if at all we did originate from hydrothermal vents. Um, not only is it that we have hydrothermal vents on Earth, but as you've probably seen from the previous video, there has been evidence for hydrothermal vents in extra terrestrial systems as well. But getting into that, um, as we already know that we have a vast ocean on Earth, um, and we are not the only ones to have a vast ocean. We have a variety of other worlds in our solar system itself that have oceans that are also salty. Um, for example, um, Saturn, some of the most famous systems are on Saturn, and Saladus and Titan, and we also have systems on Neptune as well as Jupiter um, that are that have gained increasing attention um, in the search of life outside Earth. Um, but today, I think I'm just going to briefly talk about Enceladus because that's what I'm very excited about. Um, and the reason I'm excited about Enceladus, which is the moon of Saturn, um, although it's extremely tiny um, compared to the other worlds, um, what it hosts is something extremely interesting in, in terms of um, astrobiology, but in, also in terms of geology. Um, this is an image from Cassini, uh, one of NASA's um, artificial satellites that flew by Enceladus a couple of years ago. And what you can see is these jets of spray of water coming out from these vents, or from, from the ice shell, actually. Um, and this is a general picture of what Enceladus actually looks like. Um, and what you can see is a hard rock icy shell. And beneath the icy shell is a salty ocean that is hypothesized to be present. Um, what's also interesting is that Cassini flew by with one of its probes right in through, into one of the jets and analyzed the jets for compounds. What it found was that the ocean indeed is salty. So there was sodium chloride present. Uh, but apart from that, there were a whole bunch of other compounds like methane, uh, carbon monoxide, ammonia, just to name a few. But among all of them, an interesting compound was the presence of silica. Um, and the reason silica is exciting is because silica on Earth is mainly a result of high temperature alteration of rocks, um, something that we see in hydrothermal vents in the deep sea. Um, and they, they've tried to recreate silica through other processes that are present on Enceladus, but it's highly unlikely that silica that they found was from any other process, but mainly through hydrothermal alteration or high temperature fluid rock interactions 
that is fairly comparable to hydrothermal vents that we see on Earth. So this has gained a lot of attention in the past couple of years, um, has to search for life outside Earth that Enceladus could be one of the key targets um, looking for um, the origin of life, but also looking for life um, in other forms of, in our solar system. But unfortunately, at the moment, we do not have the technology to actually penetrate through those several meters or several kilometer thick ice crust because we have barely even managed to explore our own Arctic Ocean. Um, and that's mainly because of the permanent ice cover that we have that makes it extremely difficult for deep sea exploration in the Arctic. So we have we have almost very little video footage even of the most deepest parts of this ocean. Um, and we try to use the ocean has, or the Arctic Ocean has a frontier or a last frontier in actually exploring um, other ocean worlds. So this is one of the expeditions that I had been on in 2021, um, where we we went um, to about 82 degrees north. So that's, that's fa fairly up um, into several kilometers of thick ice. So as you can see on the figure on the, on the left, um, the red spot is um, where we ventured into. Um, and just to give you an idea of how ocean exploration is done or how we do it, um, I just put a bunch of pictures here just showing how difficult it is it and why we know so little about the deepest parts. Um, so we did that with the help of an icebreaker, um, which, is, which is needed to break, to break through um, several meters of thick ice. Um, and also, as you can see here, um, this is a satellite imagery of, of the ice. Um, and the star that you see here is the known location that we wanted to explore. Um, and it's extremely difficult because um, you, you have to not only cut through the ice, but also try to be there in time and try to be there quick. Um, so you try to find these open spots of water um, or these open pools and try to make your way up there. Um, and once been up to the place that you want to study, we use something called as ROVs, which are these underwater robots um, that go to the deepest parts and actually do the exploration for us. And we actually control them from the ship. Um, just showing you how difficult is it to actually go to these spots in the Arctic and why the Arctic is so unknown to us. Um, you can see this time-lapse video of us breaking through um, meters of ice at a time and trying to find these open leads or these open pools of water um, to avoid um, time breaking more ice. Uh, but eventually you have no option, but you have to break through more ice. Um, and what you can see on the right is a figure of how we try to explore the deep sea in the Arctic. Um, so because it's, it's almost practically impossible, um, to fight with the elements, like fighting with ice, with an icebreaker, although you have one, it doesn't really help. Um, you have to just go, um, with what mother nature provides you. So, um, at some point we, we find a point that you want to explore and we point the ship in the direction of the ice flow, so knowing that the flow would take us exactly over the point um, that we want to explore um, because it's otherwise impossible to keep breaking into ice and trying to find, trying to make your way because the ice flow as well as the wind is extremely strong and it's almost fighting the elements at some point. Um, but at the end, um, after all um, the exploration and after all, um, fighting against the elements, um, we look for the first time we're actually able to explore an underwater ecosystem in the Arctic. And these are some of the pictures. Um, and you can see on the left, these are hydrothermal vents, um, and you have superheated water being spewed out. Um, and we use these various samplers for obtaining geological as well as biological sampling. Um, on the bottom left um, are these core push cores that we use to sample sediments 
Um, and on the right, you can see a bit of how the ecosystem deep down in the Arctic depths looks like. So there's a wide range of fauna that can be found even at the most in like non-habitable parts of our planet. Um, and some of the, and the fluids are extremely hot. They are way higher than 300 degrees Celsius. Um, actually feeding this ecosystem and helping life in this deep part of the Arctic actually sustain. Finally, um, I think it's to actually understand the deep sea, it's much more important to experience the deep sea to actually understand the processes that's going on. Um, this is just a final video that I put together just showing you, uh, letting you experience how the deep sea actually is. And this video is from another expedition that I had been on um, in 2019. So this is offshore Antarctica. Um, and these, again, is a hydrothermal vent ecosystem where geology actually is um, helping an entire ecosystem survive. So what you see here are actually pillow basalts and these are flesh um, lava being erupted out of the sea flow. All of these white spots are bacterial mats living off the fluids coming out of the rock.
So with that, I hope I have shed a bit of light on some of the mysteries and how um, alien the deep sea is and the various processes and how complex um, and also how geology actually sustains ecosystems in the deep sea. Yep. Thank you. I think probably if anyone does have any questions, you could probably write it in the chat or just ask me. Thanks a lot, uh, Samuel. Yeah. Uh, I think people can unmute themselves and ask if they want to ask anything. Yes, a participant can unmute and ask if they have any questions. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Okay, if no questions are coming up, maybe we can call it off. Do, does anyone have any questions before I end the meeting? Yeah, okay. It's just a thank you message. Thank you so much. It was really nice to hear this session. Yeah. In our geology is uh, um, geology at institution group. Uh, we have Samuel Pereira there, soon to be Dr. Pereira. And uh, you can ask him questions on that group also. Okay. So Samuel, thank you very much. Welcome. Yes. Thank I hope to see you soon with some other topic. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Ramesh, you can call the session close. So we can... You can close this meeting, right? Yes, yes, please. Okay. I'm ending the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Good evening.